जय राध माधवा कुंज भी हरी जय हे जय राध माधवा कुंज भी हरी जय जय गोपी जन बलभि वर हरी जय गोपी जन बलभि वर हरे पूर्णंदन भज झन यशौरनंदन भज झन झुमून थीरान चारे हम जमून थी हे ढाभ हे ध्यान गोपी जन बलभा गज जन सौर नंदन भज जन जमुन थीरा जमुन थीरा थीरा भी
Cartels like that because when a Verdunga player can't play, that helps me keep tune. <laughs> yeah, really. That's the trick. When a Madunga player can't play, then the cartel players just go like that, and that helps you keep the tune. Otherwise, the Madunga will knock you right off the whole track. Because <laughs> Madunga leads, really. Because Madunga is the key to the kirtan. If the Madunga is off, then everything gets thrown off. So in order to compensate for that, we just do that real fast, and that's kind of like a murdanga. <laughs> yeah, it's a trick. I learned it from one senior devotee. <laughs> okay. What Prabhupada say? Give him the murdanga. <laughs> sometimes the devotees would think, why is Prabhupada asking me to give up the Murdanga? <laughs> Prabhupada really wanted everything first class when it comes to Kirtan. If you were a little off, there was one devotee. He was a little strong. I mean, I don't really go along with his principle, but if you, if you couldn't play, we'd stop playing! <laughs> that's how... That's how he would, you know, let you know you couldn't play. <laughs> and everybody in the kirtan and everybody outside the door would hear it. <laughs> he was heavy. I'm just a nice guy. <laughs> I mean, in those days, it was like that. Yeah. I won't mention any names. Yeah. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this is the uh, final in the series of verses where Krishna uh, gives indication of different aspects of material energy that he is. So we can continue with the same thing. Tapanyaham maham varsam usran Nirgranam yutsrijamicha Amritam chaiva mrityus cha Sarasach chaham arjuna Tapam yaham maham varsam Nirgranam yutsrijamicha Amritam chaiva mrityus cha Sarasach chaham arjuna Tapam yaham maham varsam Nimgranam yutsrijami cha Amritam chaiva mrityus cha Sarasach Chaham Arjuna
Ladies? Oh, okay. <laughs> Continue. I was reading his pastime this morning where King Sudyumna from the ninth canto. Did you ever read that particular pastime? The, huh? You know that one? King Sudyumna. I'll tell it during the class. Right now I'll read the purport. <laughs> okay. Uh, translation. Oh, oh, word for word, right? Or did we do that yet? No. Okay. Tapami. Give heat. Aham. I. Aham. I. Varsam. Rain. Nirganami. Withhold. Utsrajami, send forth, cha, and amritam, immortality, cha, and eva, certainly, mityu, death, cha, and sat, spirit, asat, matter, cha, and ahai, I. Arjuna, translation. O oh Arjuna, I give heat and I withhold and send forth the rain. I am immortality. I am also death personified. Both spirit and matter are in me. <clears throat> Purport. Krishna by his different energies diffuses heat and light through the agency of electricity and the sun. During summer season, it is Krishna who checks rain from falling from the sky, and then during the rainy season, he gives unceasing torrents of rain. The energy which sustains us by prolonging the duration of our life is Krishna, and Krishna meets us at the end as death. By analyzing all the different energies of Krishna, we can ascertain that for Krishna there is no distinction between matter and spirit. Or in other words, he is both matter and spirit. In the advanced stage of Krishna consciousness, one therefore makes no such distinctions. He sees only Krishna in everything. Since Krishna is both matter and spirit, the gigantic universal form comprising all material manifestations is also Krishna. In his pastimes in Vrindavan as two-hander Shamasundara playing on the flute, are those of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Umagyan timidandasya gina jena salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guruvena maha shila prabhupad ki jai. So, yeah. Again, we're hearing how within all aspects of existence, and Krishna picks those things which we can really identify with. But he is all everything in complete. There's nothing outside of him. And he does everything through his different energies. But he also performs his own particular pastimes directly. So he both manifests himself and then he does everything else through his energies. He has different energies. He has spiritual energy, he has material energy, we are also part of his spiritual energy, but we are a distinctive part. We are called marginal. In the technical term, we are tatasti, tatastu, or tatasta, tatasta. Tatasta is nicely described as, if you look at a beach, and there's an ocean there, when the waves are covering the beach, the beach cannot be seen, but then sometimes the waves are not covering the beach and the beach is seen. So the beach sometimes is seen and sometimes unseen by the direction of the waves. So we are compared to that particular feature. In other words, 
we are spirit, but sometimes we get covered and sometimes we are uncovered. In the material world, we remain covered. So therefore, we are, although we're pure spiritual energy, we have a inclination to get covered by an inferior energy, which is called uh, mar marginal, not marginal, but material energy. Material energy is not as strong as spiritual energy, but because the living entity wants to enjoy material energy, and the spirit soul causes the material energy to act and cover it. It's the spirit soul that brings about its own covering. And then we are covered to different layers, and that is the material energy. But we are also his energy. Here it says he's, he can diffuse heat and light th through the agency of electricity. Electricity is the is the static energy within the uh, ka, uh, within the within the akash? Uh, you see sometimes lightning flashes. That's electricity. That's a real powerful form of electricity. Sometimes when it hits the earth, it'll hit some object in the earth and completely destroy it, like hitting a house and just burns the house to pieces, or it may hit a tree and just destroy the tree. Um, they say when it rains, don't go in your car because some, because car is like metal, and uh, electricity sometimes is attracted to metal. So sometimes you find that people get electrocuted in their cars when there is a lightning storm. Not every rainstorm produces lightning. Of course, in the Vedic system, they call it th thunderbolts. We call it lightning bolts. It's the same thing. So that's Krishna also, and that's electricity. That we harness that electricity to make our lights in the temples and everywhere around the world through these power sources. So harnessing that electricity gives an artificial kind of light. And that so that light is also coming from Krishna, although it's artificial. It starts with a the energy of Krishna electricity. And then of course the sun is the, the main source of, of light and heat. And then Krishna during rainy season, he lets the water go and during summer season he checks it from falling. So Prabhupada is very exact to explain what Krishna does like that. He sustains our life. Krishna any time can just say, all right, Let's turn off this guy's heart. Chook. Okay, you're off. You're out. So our, our existence is so tenuous. Tenuous means very thin or so precarious that any moment your heart can just go, and then you're gone. <laughs> so we, we live a very, what we say, uh, it's like walking on ice over a river. And you don't know how thick the ice is, and you, if you step on a place that's thin, you fall right into the river. So life is like that. It's very precarious and very, what we say, what's the word? Chapala sukala. It's very unsteady. At any time it could go. Choom, at any time. We don't know. There's so many ways you can die. <laughs> and of course, Kali Yuga has the men, people have thought of more ways to die. <laughs> That's what they're, and this is called dusritina, using intelligence, how to do the wrong things, creating more ways to, de to die. Just like, you know, we have this coronavirus. So, you know, you, sometimes when you get coronavirus, they have put you in a hospital, and they put you on a ventilator, and then you die. <laughs> yeah, it's usually what happens. Once you're on the ventilator, you're finished. <laughs> And it's good because as Prahlada Nanda Maharaj was saying, if every time they use the ventilator, they get thirty-two thousand dollars from the government. So it's good profit. <laughs> but that's another story. Okay, so but you know, life and death is so precarious. Then death can come at any time. Life is being produced every moment. There are hundreds of people coming into the world every day through the process of birth. There are hundreds of people going to the 
boat of Yamaraj every day through the process of death. So like that. <laughs> and then what to speak of living entities that are not even of the human species, below the human species. Some insects live only for a few hours. Some only live overnight. And some live maybe a, maybe a couple days, some a couple weeks. So death and life is happening so fast, and that's Krishna. He's not only conducting it for the humans, but for all species of life, like that. So he's, he is also that feature of existence. But then again, Prabhupada wants to make a distinction which helps us to get away from distinctions. That for Krishna, there's no such thing as matter. Matter and spirit are the same for Krishna because he controls both energies completely. And matter, we sometimes we say, is material. Material means it has no force of its own. Only when it's touched by spirit does it act and react and move and produce. But uh, that energy is Krishna also, matter dead matter. It's just a certain feature of his energies. So everything is under his control. So for a devotee, the best place to be is under the control of Krishna. <laughs> One who is not under the control of Krishna is living, living a very dangerous life. Um, they may go on with the idea that I can go on forever and go on with my plans and live accordingly. But you, as you see, um, death comes, is coming to people who never expect it. Just like right now we're talking and someone is alive right now and about the end of the class somebody will be dead but by the time this class is over. Who's alive right now when the class begins? That's how the life and death is so precarious in this world. <laughs> so yeah, and Krishna is that. He's also that. But then for the devotees, he's also this two-handed form of Shamsundar, playing on the flute in Vrindavan, herding the cows, and sporting with his friends in so many wonderful uh, relationships. That's the type of um, uh, understanding that devotees want about the Lord. We don't really give much importance, although we should know this, to all these different characteristics of Krishna being the best in all categories. The whole tenth canto, I'm sorry, the whole tenth chapter, which is coming up of, of uh, Bhagavad Gita, is Krishna mentioning himself in the best of all material categories. But Krishna at the end, after he you know, goes through who he is in different categories of himself, he says, what use if, what use is all this detailed knowledge, R. L. June? With a tiny fraction of my energy I support and pervade this whole entire creation. Fraction of his energy. The power of Krishna is not conceivable by any way. It's inconceivable how powerful Krishna is. Um, people say God is powerful, but then you have to describe. Because if you say God is powerful, you say something, but you don't give any, really, any indication of what is the nature of that power. So that's why Bhagavad Gita, in order to f support that statement, God is powerful, these statements are given. So it's just to help uh, people understand the all-powerful nature of God and the all-present nature of God, too. But for the devotees, we don't really put much time and energy in these particular aspects of the Supreme Lord. We're more interested in hearing about his pastimes in Vrindavan or in, in uh, Jagannath Puri. In other words, the devotees are interested in Krishna as a person, as he performs his different activities with his devotees. This is where the devotees find uh, happiness and inspiration in devotional service. So, but this, this, this aspect of Krishna is just to give you an understanding how great he is in the material, in a sense. For people who have no understanding of the greatness of God. You know, a lot of times, you know, 
people will say, well, God is great. And then you might ask them, well, what, how, what, can you define that greatness? And generally they can't. They just know that God is, well, he's all powerful. What does that mean? He's everywhere. What does that mean? He's all good. What does that mean? And the three things, omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. <laughs> omniscient means he knows everything everywhere. So, yeah, all these ums are Krishna. But we don't give much importance to that. We know that. These are just sidelines. These are for people who are, have to have a little bit of reverence for God. Reverence for God is nice, and it's important. Devotees also have that. But we're, interested, we're more so interested in God's when he steals butter in Vrindavan, and he... Uh, he says to the gopis, I'll meet you, and he doesn't come. <laughs> and then he plays with the cows, or he's wrestling with his friends, like that. These are the things that attract the minds and hearts of the devotees, because these are the things that actually purify our consciousness and attract our consciousness to Krishna. If somebody is, if you know somebody who is all-powerful, uh, how, how much are you attracted to that? I mean, you might talk about him a little bit. But when you know what he does, and you know his activities are just so amazing, then your attraction is, is greater, automatically. Like, so the, the, the more you know about a person, the more you're, who is who has attractive qualities, the more you become attracted, and the more you become attracted, the more you become, uh, what we say, connected. So therefore, we want to connect more and more with Krishna through his leelas. So devotees, so Bhagavad Gita is preliminary. It gives us a basis of, of who God is and what his relationship with the material energy is, what his relationship with the living entities, how he interacts. It's foundational to understanding higher knowledge. But when you start reading Srimad Bhagavatam, it starts to define Krishna as the all-powerful source again. But then it goes on to describe how that all-powerful source manifests his power in the form of creation. So then you get into the different aspects of how creation unfolds. Because, you know, what do they say uh, in the Bible? Uh, God created Adam and Adam you know, was alone, he was kind of like morose and he needed a girlfriend. <laughs> so they did a, a, an operation and pulled something out of his uh, spleen and there was Mataji, she appeared on the scene. So you had Adam and Eve and then Adam and Eve propagated and then there was some, and then there's creation. <laughs> But then you hear about Mahavishnu glancing over the material energy with his, you know, Shakti energies. So you get a detailed understanding of actually what creation is about. That's in the beginning of the Bhagavatam. And it goes on for, of course, Bhagavatam sets the stage in the first canto by describing the history with Maharaj Parikshit and Yudhisthir, like that, and the Pandavas, which centers around the intrigue of the battle of Kurukshetra. Well, then the second canto is all about, uh, mostly about creation and the greatness of God in that aspect of the creator principle. And the third canto begins like that, but then he takes off and gets, and gets into different pastimes of the Lord Varaha Dev is the first one that starts to manifest. And then you get into different energy. So why does Bhagavatam go through all of that uh, preliminary stuff that's really mentioned in the very basic forms in Gita because nobody will accept or no intelligent person will accept Krishna as being a cowherd boy in Vrindavan who does mischievous things apparently acts like an ordinary person but in a very extraordinary way and he he's controlled by those persons who he he's playing with or interacting with. 
So that doesn't fit into anybody's conception of God. It just doesn't work. So therefore, Bhagavatam has to really set the stage by defining Krishna as the all-powerful creator in the beginning, and then that same person who is that all-powerful creator is heard about and talked about in his intimate life in Sri Vrindavan Dham. And then you can make the connection. But if that wasn't there in the very beginning of the Bhagavatam, people would not be able to accept that God is simply a person who plays with cows, steals clothes of girls, and steals butter, lies, <laughs> like that. It'll seem, it seems, and it still does for, for most people, it seems like some, some made up stories, that's all it is. But we know because uh, Krishna Arjun has confirmed it in the uh, in the tenth chapter. He speaks one verse, uh, ten, twelve, I think it is. Yeah, ten, yeah, ten, thirteen. Param dam Brahma param dharma pavitram param bhavam purusham shashvatam divya mari deva majam vibhu. Ahustvam Vrsayam Sarve Devarshi Nardadastata Asita Devalovya Swayamit Chaiva Bhavishime. Arjuna says, You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ultimate bit bold, the purest, the absolute truth. You are the eternal, transcendental, original portion, the unborn, the greatest. All the great sages such as Narada, Sita, Deva, Vyas confirm this confirm this of you. And now you yourself are declaring it unto me. So, what is Arjuna doing? He's after hearing about Krishna, and he understands that Krishna is the absolute principle of everything great. And I'm not just saying it, I'm just repeating the words of the great souls. So these same great souls also describe the intimate pastimes of Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. So, as Prabhupada said, what, what would these great personalities have to do with making up fictitious stories? <laughs> what benefit would they get? Well, they're actually speaking about the nature of the Supreme Personality of God and in His most intimate aspect, His pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham, which is the goal of those who are aspiring to go back home, back to Godhead, to hear about these pastimes too chant these pastimes, remember these pastimes, like that. And the literature available is voluminous. The literature available is voluminous. So, and you get a really, indig a really strong understanding of the Supreme Personality of Godhead when you read Srimad Bhagavatam. Then both his all-powerful feature, his sweet feature, and his relationship with the devotees are all very, very extensively described in Srimad Bhagavatam, like that. And then you get an idea. But here, we're getting just the basic principles here, which are necessary, because without basics, you can't really build the higher principles. <laughs> That's why uh, people like to go to the 10th canto automatically and hear about these pastimes. Because what do they do? They start to imagine that these things, these things are done by some ordinary person, and I can do them too. <laughs> so then they want to imitate Krishna, and then they become current, then they become polluted, <laughs> like that. So that's why Bhagavatam waits till the very end, practically the end, before they deliver Krishna and Vrindavan to help prepare the consciousness of the reader by going through the different elements of Krishna's relationship with his devotees, his pastimes in the different universes, and also his feature as Narayan within the Vaikuntha realm. So we get a complete understanding of God, and then, then the tenth canto starts to reveal his intimate nature, his sweet nature like that. So the, the, the uh, goal for us 
is to really come to the point of developing an attraction for hearing and speaking the pastimes of Krishna and Vrindavan. So you can tell. If you don't have that attraction, then you have there's something you have to work on. <laughs> and how do you get that attraction? The attraction comes by, by hearing it, by doing it. And also through the process of carefully chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, purifying our consciousness, that purification of consciousness brings the attraction stronger. And, and as the purification of consciousness continues through the process of uh, chanting the holy names, then we relish even more these pastimes. They become so sweet. And then uh, sometimes you see when you get an attraction for these things, you just don't want to stop. You just, just want to hear more and more like that. And so that's, then, that is an indication that you are making nice spiritual progress. So we that we want to we want to make we want to get to that stage of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. It also comes by serving the Vaishnavas. As we serve the devotees, we also get purified from some of the bad qualities that we have, and then that opens up our ability to be more receptive to Krishna's pastimes like that. So all these things are assisting us of getting to the essence. The essence is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. <laughs> like that. <clears throat> I was reading the Bhagavatam this morning. It was nothing about Krishna this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading the ninth canto. <clears throat> One king. Well, it actually started from the end of the eighth canto, where Satyavrat... King Satyavrata got the special mercy of Matsya, the incarnation of the fish, fish incarnation of the Lord. And uh, he was blessed, offered nice prayers. And after he left his body in that particular uh, life, he became a Manu in his next life. And he was Stradadeva Manu, who was in the uh, uh, Manu, I think he was one of the Manu. well Stradadeva Manu was his name and uh, so he wanted to have a son so he wanted to perform a yagya so when he was performing he, so he initiated these priests to perform a yagya but just when the yagya was about to begin his wife he wanted a male son. And Vashishta was there to also conduct the yagya, the great Vashishta Muni, a very powerful Muni. So just before the yagya was about to start, Shraddhadev's wife ran up to the priest and said, uh, I want a girl. <laughs> so when the, when the yagi was beginning and the mantras were chanting, just about the time when the main mantra was chanting, the priest remembered and chanted one, mantra, one word to indicate girl. So uh, when the child came out of the yagya, it was a girl. Now, Stradadev was kind of happy but at the same time, he was disappointed because he wanted a boy. He was happy because he had a child, but he had wanted a boy. So then he said, well, you know, your yagya people, they're good. <laughs> they're uh, expert, but what happened? <laughs> so Vashishta said, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, Vashishta meditated on the situation, and he understood the priest, you know, chanted this one word called Vasit. The Vasit was the word. And that indicated girl. So then um, um, Strada Davis said, well, c can you do something about it? So Vashishtha did his meditation, and he changed the girl into a boy <laughs> by his power. The girl's name was Ela, and so now he changed the name of the, and changed it into a boy. And the boy's name was Sudyumnya. So the Sunyunya grew up, and he was a great king, very beautiful looking. 
So one day, him and his uh, small group of ministers were riding, and they decided to go visit Lord Shiva in his forest. So they went; they were going to visit Lord Shiva, but as soon as they got into the forest of Lord Shiva, all of them turned into women. <laughs> the Sudhyagya and all the, all his soldiers, a few of them, they all they all stood looking at each other, and they all felt real bad. Oh, now we became Mataji's, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm glad there's no ladies here tonight. <laughs> well, we are on the screen. Okay, I'm sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> so, so, they all became ladies. And uh, so, they're looking at each other. So, why did that happen? Because a one... Uh, series of one one king and some soldiers came through the forest one time, and Shiva was there with Parvati, and they were in a very intimate and very uh, compromising position. So when the soldiers came in, uh, and Parvati, or Uma, her name was, became embarrassed, and therefore she immediately started to, you know, take precautions. And she became a little upset. So Shiva, in order to please his wife, said, anybody who comes into this forest will turn into a woman, any man. So Sudhyagya and his soldiers and ministers didn't know. So they walked in, <laughs> and they all became ladies. So you might, you know, of course, he was a, a girl in the first place when he was born. Now he became a boy. Now he's a woman again. <laughs> so he went, now, he... Uh, He's a woman. So now then he, um, let me see if I can remember all the details of this pastime. Uh, yeah. So now he went back and tried to rule his kingdom, but people weren't so happy. <laughs> and he was a lady now, <laughs> same person. <laughs> so, um, um, he said to uh, he meditated. Oh, he meditated on Vish Vashishta. That's right. He meditated on Vashishta, and Vashishta came through, and granted him that uh, he would become a man again. But then, oh, in order to do that, he had to contact Lord Shiva. So he prayed to Lord Shiva, Vashishta, so to, to bring his disciple back to a, a male body. Shiva says. Well, I promised Parvati, so I can give you a benediction that one month he's a male and one month he's a female. <laughs> yeah. So he ruled the kingdom like that. One month he was a Mataji and one month he was a Prabhuji. <laughs> but the, as it says, we said, the, the, the citizens weren't so happy like that. Anyway, uh, after some time, um, anyway, there was another story about the son of the moon god who gave, who became attracted to him as a her. Prabhupada talks about how the material body is changeable. He said even in the secular world, they take operations and they make boys girls and girls boys. I remember I was in one temple in America and I was with a Mataji who was a Vietnam veteran in the war. <laughs> she was a, a soldier, but she was a he at then. <laughs> and now it's a, she was a she. So, uh, uh, yeah, I had a hard time. She wanted, to, she wanted to take shelter of one of my dear God brothers. And he became really alarmed because <laughs> he was thinking, what kind of karma is this, you know? Am I going to get this kind of karma? So then when he, she, I'm not sure which one we should refer to, but decided not to <laughs> take shelter of that guru, that guru told me, well, I'm so happy. <laughs> so I know a few, I know at least two devo two or three devotees in, Amer in our movement have, who have had sex changes. So it happens like that. Like that. 
And sometimes people are not happy with their gender, so they think they can function differently in another gender. Like, so that happens. You can even do it by operations. They, they do that. But you still retain some of the genes of your original birth like that. So you'll find it's never exact like that. But this, Prabhupada makes this point that, you know, the, this, uh, the, it, the body is simply a dress. It's a covering over the soul. So we should not be so concerned about the covering. We should be concerned about the soul. The dress is there. And so the dress teaches us to, we have to behave in a certain way according to the gender we are. But ultimately, it's not so important. What's really important is the soul. So the focus on that. And that was Prabhupada's main point. Finally, Su Suyagya, uh, he got married. And then, of course, to the moon god, the son of the moon god, and had four, three, three very pious sons. And then he had another son who was Pururava. And Pururava comes up again in the ninth canto. You can hear about him. His stories are very interesting with Urvasi, the society girl. And then after some time, he gives up his kingdom, goes to the forest, leaves Purava in charge of the kingdom, and uh, he just goes for self-realization. So that's the whole pastime. <laughs> like that, so. So yeah, you can, you know, you're hearing about these things from Bhagavatam. So it's just to sh give you a little different indications of how uh, the material energy works and how great souls interact with the material energy, like that. Okay, so um, any questions? Comments? Doesn't have to be directly related to the class. Yes. You're speaking that people uh, in uh, basically they don't uh, uh, know how great God is this, or when Bible speaks about creation, they it's just ten sentences of how this world was created. But why they don't accept Srimad Bhagavatam? Because it's like Sankhya philosophy, you can, it's very deep philosophy how everything works and how matter is... Uh, Changeable? Yeah, and how matter is connected with spirit and everything. Well, they accept the atheistic Sankhya philosophy, which gives 24 elements, which are all the material elements. And they're generally correct, but they don't con con include the 25th element, which is the super soul, which is taught by, you know, Kapila, the supreme personality of Godhead. So there's two Kapilas, one who teaches the atheistic theory without the super soul, and the one who teaches uh, the complete theory. So they like the atheistic one because there's no commitment to anything. It's just studying the material energy and how it works. And generally the atheistic uh, Kapila was correct in the way he defined how the material energy works, but he doesn't give the source of how it works, what's behind that working. It's more interactions with the material elements. But, but material elements, although they interact, they cannot be interacted simply by their own volition. They has to be inspired by spirit. Spirit has to move matter. Spirit moves matter. And matter, matter interacts. So the scientists and the, the atheists, they all, all they can see is the interaction of matter and they think matter is moving like that. They can't see the, the element behind that which is spirit. Therefore, they remain in ignorance of how this material world is working mm -hmm. and who's making it work and how it, you know. So you're, the question is, you're asking why they're like that? 
No, why they stick on this uh, philosophy, which is not, uh, which is very. It's non-committal. Basic. <laughs> yes, yeah, non. You don't have. You don't have nothing. When you commit to yourself to God, then you have to change. As soon as you commit to yourself to God, then you have to work under the laws of God. Everyone's working under the laws of God anyway, but when you voluntarily accept the laws of God, then you accept that, that those laws that He is using in order to govern, you know, your life. But people want to be independent of everything. They want to do their own thing or they want to choose what they want to do. They consider themselves to be in charge, but they don't. They can't see that they're controlled at every minute. That's why they're always frustrated in their attempt to enjoy in this world, because they, although they try to control, they can't control, and even if they do control something, they can't really guarantee that they're going to be happy through that control. <laughs> Yeah, we were all like that before we joined, right? <laughs> so it's not hard to understand. <laughs> Everyone's controlled. It depends on who you want to be controlled by. You want to be controlled by Krishna through his external energy. You want to be controlled by Krishna through the internal energy. But everyone's controlled by Krishna. You want to be controlled by the state, by becoming a good citizen and following the laws, or you want to be controlled by the, the state by living in the prison house. <laughs> Both people are controlled by the state. One is a free citizen and the other one is under, you know, a harsh existence. So God is controlling all aspects. We have a, everyone has a choice. But generally, people are ignorant, and therefore, they don't, they don't have the knowledge nor the understanding of how to get out of their ignorance either. Jai Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. So that's, what, that's our job, to make the unintelligent intelligent. <laughs> Jai, Panchatattva Ki Jai. Anything else? Okay, so we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai, Sri Gornatai Ki Jai, Sri Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada.